lived some 15 years earlier as ink on paper in a seaside port in the state of Santa Catarina. Frank and Mary Westfall began their work in Wisconsin, USA, where Frank worked to reach the German-speaking population. He attended Battle Creek College and taught at Union College before answering God's call to serve as a missionary. In 1894, the General Conference decided to send him to South America as the first ordained minister. In August 1894, Frank, Mary, their son and baby daughter arrived in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Frank was appointed president of the South America East Coast Mission which covered the territories of Argentina, Uruguay, Paraguay, and Brazil. Frank wasted no time and immediately traveled to Crespo, Argentina, where a group of Adventist believers were waiting. There, he helped establish the first Adventist church in South America. Soon, Frank turned his attention to Brazil. On July 18, 1894, Frank began visiting various places in the state of Sao Paulo meeting with interested families, and starting branch Sabbath schools. One of those stops was in Piricicaba, where he baptized Guillaume Stein, Jr., the first Brazilian believer to be baptized in the country. From there, Frank traveled to Gaspar Alto to meet with another group of interested believers. When he arrived, he tried to find a place to hold meetings, but was met with opposition from the local religious leader. Finally, he decided to hold meetings by the river. On Sabbath, June 8th, after celebrating the Lord's Supper, eight people were baptized. A few days later, 15 more people were baptized. On June 15th, the first Brazilian Adventist church was established in Gaspar Alto, less than 40 miles from where the Adventist message had first arrived 15 years earlier. After laboring in the mission field for five months, Frank returned to Buenos Aires to tragedy. His daughter Helen had taken ill and died on June 15th. Two weeks before his return and on the same day he had helped establish the church in Gaspar Alto. Despite tragedy and hardships, the West Falls continued on and gave a total of 27 years of service in South America. Today, there are more than 1.7 million Seventh-day Adventists in Brazil and more than 18,000 churches and companies. There is one Adventist for every 122 people. To pioneer missionaries like Frank and Mary Westfall, we say Obrigado. Hello church family, happy Sabbath, welcome to church, it's good to see everyone out today. I'm just here representing our health ministries team, reminding you that it's already next Sabbath when I'm going to do the health program, the afternoon program. So Sabbath the 6th of May, starting from 2pm after our shared lunch, I'm, we're going to meet in here to, to have a health presentation, health topic. And then there will be a workshop afterwards, a bit of food tasting. So just to remind you all, if you want to bring any friends, family, neighbors, any, it would be a lovely outreach opportunity. So it's next Sabbath, the 6th of May at 2 p.m. I hope to see you there. Thanks, uh, Dr. Camilla. It is once again my privilege to welcome each and everyone to Fangare Seventh-day Adventist Church. 
For those who are viewing uh, live stream online on a weekly basis, we would like to invite you as well. For those who will be watching this uh, live stream at the later part archive on uh, Seventh-day Adventist Church YouTube uh, channel, we would like to uh, welcome you. We would like to welcome our uh, visitors this morning. If it is your first time to attend Pangare Adventist Church, we would like to heartily welcome you. If you are a regular attender, attendee of Pangare Adventist Church, we would like to welcome you as well. If you travel far from afar, especially uh, Pastor Clifton, we would like to uh, welcome for those who be, uh, people who are uh, traveling from afar. And for our uh, regular uh, members, we would like to welcome you as well. We've got a couple of uh, announcements here be before we get things going. The library will be open just after the uh, service. So if you need some books or good reading materials for you to take home, just pop in the uh, library out there. It's just adjacent to our uh, kitchen. Uh, our head uh, deaconess is looking after our library so we can just pop in after the uh, service. So, as announced uh, earlier by uh, Dr. Camilla, the health uh, ministry will be conducting this health uh, seminar after uh, church. So, everybody is once again invited to our uh, first uh, Sabbath uh, potluck uh, lunch. So, just bring uh, with you uh, a dish and an extra for our uh, visitors and after that, we'll just come here straight to uh, church and then listen to this wonderful seminar about about our health. So it is once again a privilege for uh, Fangare Adventist Church to have a pastor, to have our uh, speaker who is on an executive committee for the North New Zealand Conference. He is the regional pastor down Oakland, he looks after Brentwood and Waitakere Church, Pastor. And if you don't know uh, Pastor uh, uh, Clifton, during the pandemic, you have seen Pastor Clifton be a part of a participant in Hubchat. So if you have seen him on that, uh, what do you call this, that uh, uh, the, the, the video where they uh, discuss uh, a couple of things. He was on Hubchat. And if you remember when they live stream Pastor Dog's uh, visitation in uh, Oakland, Pastor Clifton was the one who accommodated Pastor Dog Bachelor. So if you don't know Pastor Clifton uh, Glasgow, now is the time for you to know more about him. And with him today is... It's a lovely wife, uh, Tiangi, who would like to welcome once again, accompanying uh, Pastor Clifton, uh, driving up all the way here to Fangaroo, make sure that he doesn't fall asleep at the back of the wheel. So welcome, Pastor, and we believe that the message that the Pastor will once again encourage us and once again give us the boost we need for us to live this journey in our Christian life. The, the church has this uh, program of introducing our uh, members because some of our members don't know who uh, the person who sits or who is beside that uh, person. So in a uh, uh, regular basis, every Sabbath we invite a person who will be interviewed and will ask more about this church member for us to know more about her or him, not only them being uh, greeted in our, uh, in our church. So the, uh, the lucky uh, person this uh, morning is no other than uh, Deborah Walker. Thank you once again, uh, Deborah, for your willingness for this for your willingness to be uh, interviewed, not interrogated, and for the, come closer, come closer, <laughs> and for us to know more about Deborah. At first, 
I thought her name was Deborah. Because you Kiwis make shortcut of everything. I thought it was Deborah, but it was Deborah. It not, it's not Deborah. Not short for Deborah, but Deborah D B D E B R A. So thank you once again, Deborah. First question: Are you nervous? Extremely. Me too. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> okay. So, what does Deborah do for a living, a job, or occupation? Okay. Originally, I am a saddler by trade. So um, that's just repairing saddles, harness wear, and making all that. And that's always been my love and my passion. And from that, it's I've, I've diversed into other jobs, bits and pieces. And I, it sort of helps you to turn your hand to anything. So, um, yeah, I've done a lot of variety work um, from various other jobs since then. Mm. So is job related to your hobby? So what are your hobbies, by the way? My hobbies are anything and everything. I'm always um, renovating, um, doing the house up, I don't pay anybody, I just do it myself, find out my own way of doing things and just getting on and doing it. So I'm always decorating, renovating, chopping down things, building things, well not building things, but just always living rural and just getting on with the job. There you go. So if you want some <laughs> renovation, they're best here. Paid, paid by the R. So, how did you come to know about the Seventh-day Adventist faith, Seventh-day Adventist church? Because one day I turned up and you were there. Ah, it was through the TV programs. It was through First Light and the Hope channels. And there was an amazing um, uh, TV program by Mark Woodman. And when I saw that, I was just intrigued by everything he said. And that led me to this church. And also because you did Bible study. And I was just itching to find a place that did Bible study so I could learn more and stuff like that. And then later on when you found that you were convicted of this Adventist faith, you took it into yourself to create this personal miniature of giving away care packs. Is this still ongoing? It's still ongoing. Um, it's slightly diversified with the help of everybody in the church. I wouldn't say it's me, I'd say it's, it's everybody. So when we all help as a collective, we can all help mm -hmm. other people. Yeah, I believe that uh, Deborah gives away uh, these uh, care packs to uh, newly born uh, babies. So she, she contacts uh, one of the uh, uh, midwives and then she gives this beautifully uh, pack, a beginner's care pack. And then, yeah, uh, some of the mothers were, are really overwhelmed with this care pack. Actually, I gave one to my, uh, to the wife of my uh, son who had his uh, second baby, and she was really oh, overwhelmed. She was really overwhelmed. So, where do you find, where do you see yourself in your spiritual journey in the Seventh-day Adventist Church? Always learning. <laughs> Always learning. Yeah. Always learning. Always learning. Yeah. Always learning. So, last question before I let you go. What are your words of wisdom or advice for those who want to join the Adventist Church, who want to learn more about Christ? Um, I, th I think like, like for me, it was just feeling convicted. It was just something that I needed, needed, like I was searching for something. And, and then I eventually, you know, I, f I found it here. And, then, and I, I think God sort of opens the doors for you. And, and lead you. If you might, you might end up in the wrong church, but then he will lead you to the right church. So. Yes. Also, what Debbie is telling is that go to the Bible to find the real church. Mm. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Debbie, once again for giving us the uh, the privilege to know more about you. So please don't be uh, offended or don't be uh, nervous when some of the elders will approach you and then ask you to be in front of you. Everybody has. To be, everybody has his time. So, if someone, uh, uh, one of the elders will approach you, please don't say no. Just say yes. Okay, <laughs> thank you. So, I would like to invite you now to bow or have that attitude of prayer while we hear and find Neil in silent prayer.
Great to see you all here again this morning. We're going to sing our first song, which is called Wake the Song. This was written by William F. Sherman. And, um, you know, let us just banish every thought of sadness. As, as friends, we meet here today on his Sabbath, telling the old, old story and precious theme of God's love. If you would all stand with me, please, as we sing the song, Wake the Song. Wake the song of joy and gladness is for uh, local uh, budget but before we collect our offering we would like to ask one of the uh, teens to read a uh, bible verse is that Mutsa? thank you Mutsa. There are a couple of ways in uh, giving back our tithes and uh, offering. One is uh, through e uh, giving, and giving through e giving is a bit uh, tricky because you have to make sure that you put in your donation, your gift to the proper uh, to.
to the proper uh, category, so your, uh, your, uh, your, your, your tithe and offering will be going to that specific uh, area. Thank you, Mr. Sorry? No, that's, uh, hold on. That's Kirsten in Corinthians. Okay, hold on. Second Corinthians 9, 6 to 8. Second Corinthians 9, 6 to 8. Um, this is Second Corinthians 9, 6 to 8. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor, their righteousness endures forever. Thank you. Let us now ask the uh, deacon and deacon and sister, please accept our free wills. Tithes and offering. Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father in Heaven, we acknowledge Thee, dear Heavenly Father, as the sustainer of life. And once again, dear Heavenly Father, as we return back our tithes and offerings, we would like to thank Thee once again, dear Lord, for bountifully blessing us, dear Heavenly Father. Bless these uh, finances, dear Lord, that we also be used in blessing others, dear Heavenly Father. And thank you once again, dear Lord, for the Holy Spirit that is once again always by our side, dear Heavenly Father. Once again, giving us this heart, being a heart that once again makes us a cheerful giver. So thank you once again, dear Lord, for the funds, the tithes and offerings that may be used in furtherance of thy cause for the advancement of thy work. For this we pray in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning. Oops. Oh, now I'm here. Children's story. I'm sure there's some children. There were some children in our Sabbath school. So I know we've got at least four. Everyone must be hiding. Okay, good morning to you all. I hope you're having a happy Sabbath so far. It's raining, but that's all right. We're still fine in here, aren't we? I want to tell you a story about something that happened to me when I was a bit younger. I wasn't as young as you. I was just in high school. Um, so I'm just, I don't know 
what years it is, it's year nine or ten or something. I enjoyed sport when I was at when I was at school. And there was something that I really, really enjoyed, and that was we used to call it basketball. I believe that now they call it netball, so that's changed. And at that stage I was goalie, but these days they call it goal shoot. So I'm not quite sure, but anyway. Okay, so our school was way out in the country and we had trials at our school and then we'd go, if we managed to get past those trials at school, we'd go to the trials in Christchurch, which was about, about an hour's travel away. And we would get to the trials at Christchurch and we'd be playing, playing netball, the boys would be playing rugby and some of them were playing soccer but I was playing netball and I really enjoyed it. No schoolwork, just a, a morning of fun. And then we would all go for lunch. And after lunch, we all sat around in a, on the concrete and they would announce the team that was going to represent Canterbury. You know, Canterbury's probably a little bit like Northland. We have the Northland rugby team up here and then we have the Auckland one. Canterbury's a big area. And so we were all sitting down around, and I had been on these trials before, so wasn't really expecting to hear my name, but, oh, wow, my name come up. And I thought, wow, I'm going to represent Canterbury. This is something pretty, pretty good. So we all, they got all the names, and we're sitting there, and then they said everyone whose name was not called out was to go back to their buses. So there we were, this little group of girls sitting there, and they started telling us the rules of what we were going to be doing. Now, my mum had very carefully found out before I went that none of the games were going to be played on Sabbath. So I was quite happy, thought everything's working out fine for me this time. And so it was pretty neat to be chosen for this. Anyway, we are all sitting there, and we were told how we were to behave and how we were to bring proper healthy food and all the other things they tell you. And then they said, hands up those who can't come to practices on Saturdays. Well, that really rocked my boat pretty much because I knew that I was way out in Oxford, which was a long car drive away, and I knew my mum would not bring me, and I knew my older brothers and sisters wouldn't bring me, because they knew that it would upset mum. So I thought, oh. So I had to put my hand up. And there were a couple of others that put their hands up, and they came up the front, and they talked to the coaches, and they said, we can't come because we can't get there, because there's no way, you know. So they arranged, they said, that's fine, we can do that. And I thought, I can't use that excuse then, because they're going to... They're gonna, no. So I had to say to them, I'm sorry, I can't come because I can't practice on Saturday. My mum won't let me come down and practice on Saturday. So my dreams were all crashed and I thought, oh, darn. Fancy being chosen and then rejected. That was pretty awful. And I, on the way home on the bus, I felt pretty miserable. But anyway, I know that Jesus will never reject me. I know that he is always willing for me to be there. And I want you boys and girls all, all to choose Jesus as your coach, as your guide. And my advice is just three words. Always choose Jesus. Okay, you can go back to your seats now. We're going to be sharing a song now that is called I Heard the Voice of Jesus Say. You know, we can trust in our Lord that the words that he gives us are true 
and they are right. And we can stand on his promises. So let's all be standing, please, as we join together in this song. Let his will be done. Have thine own way.
Before I invite you to kneel with me to ask the Lord in prayer, we'll just ask, I'd like to read a Bible verse for us to know more about how we could present our hearts to God. Thank you, Lucky. Psalm 51, 10 to 13. Create me a pure heart, heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to, su to sustain me. Amen. I would like to invite now for those who are able to please kneel down or with me or bow down or have the reverence of prayer as we talk to the Lord. Our dear Heavenly Father in Heaven, You are our Supreme God, dear Lord. We acknowledge Thee as our one true God. You are the sustainer of life. You give all our needs, dear Heavenly Father. And at this moment, dear Heavenly Father, we bow down. We kneel down. We act and do things that will be in your reverence, dear Heavenly Father. We acknowledge, dear Lord, that we are no more less than sinners, dear Heavenly Father. We like to acknowledge thee, dear Lord, that without thee, dear Heavenly Father, there is no hope for us, dear Lord. We like to acknowledge thee, dear Lord, for being our judge, for Jesus Christ being our mediator, dear Heavenly Father. The battle is won, and we would like to give our allegiance to Thee, dear Heavenly Father. So thank You once again, dear Heavenly Father, for dying on the cross for us, dear Heavenly Father. Please help us, dear Heavenly Father, that we may create, that You may create clean hearts in our lives, dear Heavenly Father. Please take out this heart of stone and please replace it with a heart of flesh. We thank Thee, Dear Heavenly Father, for all of the bountiful blessings you have given to us, dear Heavenly Father. Though the world is in turmoil at the moment, dear Heavenly Father, we have, though we have members, dear Heavenly Father, who are having issues with their health, dear Heavenly Father, who have some difficulties in their family relationship, people who are having a difficulties, dear Heavenly Father, in their financial needs. We know, dear Lord, that you are always there, dear Lord, that they may also feel your presence, dear Lord, even if they are not here amongst us this morning. We would like to thank you, dear Lord, for the members of the church, for this community of faith who are encouraging each and everyone, dear Heavenly Father, as we journey into this last stretch of life. We thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for the trials that comes into our lives, dear Heavenly Father. Though the strong wind blows in our path, we know, dear Heavenly Father, that those winds are used to clear our path, dear Heavenly Father. A special prayer, dear Heavenly Father, for 
Pastor Clifton, dear Lord. We know, dear Lord, that He is your servant. He is a man of God, dear Lord. And we would like to thank Thee once again, dear Lord, for the Holy Spirit that is giving Him the message, dear Lord. For the message that He's going to be, see, be giving us this morning, dear Lord. And once again, May his message be planted in our hearts, embedded in our minds, the Heavenly Father, retains in our thoughts, that we may be able to share this message, the Heavenly Father, that may be, it may be an encourage for those souls out there who are longing, seeking for thy presence, dear Lord, and for thy love. May we feel your love this morning, dear Heavenly Father, and thank you once again, dear Lord, for the forgiveness of our sins. For this we pray in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Well, happy Sabbath. Is it that happy? Huh? <laughs> happy Sabbath. It's good to see you. Wonderful to be here. And it's lovely to be, to get around to our churches. This is the first time I've been inside the Whangarei Church. So thank you for allowing me to come inside and uh, share the word with you. And it's good to see some friends from Dargaville. Lovely to see you in South Africa. And I'd like to thank David for the invitation to come here and to open the word with you. And uh, I just pray what a blessing it is to live in Whangarei, isn't it? It's supposed to be the winterless north, but I think we get a little bit of winter. Is that honest? I'm not sure. Eh? <laughs> it's good to be with you. Well, my name's Clifton Glasgow. I, my lovely wife Tiangi is, is there, and uh, I have um, three daughters. We figured if we went for a, the fourth to be a son, I'd have to buy a minivan, and I gave up. We've got Three daughters, one wife, and two female dogs. So everything in the house is female, except for me. So please pray for me. If I leave the toilet seat up, I get in big trouble. So times five. But no, God has been good to us, and uh, we've been blessed in ministry. I started off in Sydney, Australia. In fact, in Newcastle and then Sydney. And then we came back home to New Zealand. So I grew up in Auckland, New Zealand. So praise God that we're able to be here. Well, it's my privilege to be able to share the word. I'm just going to ask if we can bow our heads for a word of prayer. Let's pray. Father, what a joy it is to come here and be with you, to be with the saints in Whangarei. And Lord, we just pray a special blessing as we come to worship you. May our hearts be open as we look at what's happening in our world. May you speak to our hearts in a very, very special way. Bless us now as we shut ourselves in with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I want to talk about secularism and Samson-like Christians. And hopefully the title makes sense by the time we get to the end. But I've got some stats for you. If you like stats, we'll have a little bit of stats today. There is an organization that does research on church and religion, Pew Research, and these statistics, unfortunately, are in America. Now, what they found was 65% of Americans identify themselves as Christians. Now, that sounds pretty good, doesn't it? In fact, in New Zealand, I believe the last census was just under 40%, but I know all religion was under 50%. So 65% identify themselves as Christians. However, less than half this number were very religious. Now, they, what they did was they did a test. And with that test, they wanted to identify a Christian worldview. So, so they want to identify who had a Christian worldview because anybody can say they're a Christian. In fact, some people who grew up Christian, they put up their hand and they said, well, I'm a Christian. But then they said, well, let us get a little bit more prescriptive. Let us kind of figure out who actually had a Christian worldview. And they did a test, and I'll show you the test. These, these are the six 
prerequisites and you can identify whether you're a real Christian or not. Hey, So here we go. What They had to accept that in fact there was truth. That's point one. They had to accept that the Bible is accurate in its principles that it teaches. They had to accept that Satan is a real being or force, not merely symbolic. They acknowledged and accepted a person cannot earn their way into heaven by trying to be good or doing good works. It's through the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Jesus lived a sinless life. And God is the all-knowing, all-powerful creator of the world who still rules the universe today. That's what, if, you, if you, you're you not a heretic, eh? In fact, you've got a Christian worldview if you accept all of those things. Now, in 2020, what they did was they found that 6% of all American adults have a biblical worldview. Now, that's very different than the 65. So many people were saying, yeah, we're Christian, but only 6% of them actually had a Christian worldview. Among 18 to 29-year-olds, that number drops to 2%. Perhaps even more shocking, researchers found that just 21% of those attending evangelical Protestant churches. Now, these are the Bible-believing, Bible-preaching churches. In fact, if we were to fit anywhere on the census, we would be somewhere in there. Protestant churches have a biblical worldview. In other words, one in five in those churches, with the number, uh, that number dropping to one in ten, or just under one in ten in the mainline churches. So what's, what's happening What's going on that we have many saying, yes, we're Christian, but in reality, the worldview has skewed. In fact, uh, some people said, is what's happening really affecting the church? What are some ways you're seeing Christians being influenced by the secular world around us in what we believe, how we think, or how we live out our faith. Something is happening in our world that it's eroding the Christian fabric. And here's some responses. We'll we just get a few responses of what some people wrote. Now, this person says, everything has become very self-centered. So this is, this is how they see the world impacting them. You be you instead of be who God, who God made you to be. You got this instead of God is in control. Live your best life instead of live to the glory of God. You're so strong instead of God is strong in our weakness. Another person wrote this, I see Christians get mad when other Christians point out or expose false doctrines and teachers. Today it's believed we're supposed to accept all views even of the Bible. And if we don't, we're supposedly breaking the commandment to love one another. So these people are just writing up here how they see the world impacting Christianity. Now notice what else? The idea of universalism, or that many roads lead up to the same summit, is causing many to loosely handle sin and other core doctrines. This was another thing that they wrote. In our own life, in my own life, now I like this one because this person wasn't talking about others, they were talking about their own experience and how they felt the world was influencing them. They said, in my own life, it manifests itself as forgetting God's promises, prayerlessness, gracelessness, impatience, cynicism, bitterness, and failing to know or understand how I'm supposed to respond in tough or unexpected moments. So something's happening in the world that people see as eroding their faith. Notice this, I find it more challenging to witness to others and to speak up and defend my own faith and the faith of my brothers and sisters. I now fear not just rejection or ridicule, but retaliation. Don't know if you've been on social media. 
and you go to post something, some of us now are thinking twice. Uh, it was interesting. I was uh, with a friend, and, and recently uh, she was telling me, and I noticed she put something up. And in recent times, we've been having challenges with uh, freedom of speech. I'm not sure if you've noticed that. I hope you have. And, and they, 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 they wrote, freedom of speech, where art thou? That's what they wrote. And the bombardment on their social media page to attack them for asking where freedom of speech was. There's something happening to secular culture. I don't get as excited during the worship of my Savior as I do during a sports event. So people are saying, something's in our world. Now, the idea about secularism was originally, we know when, when they left the old world and they came over to America, the idea was to have a secular culture which was neutral. In other words, you could have the church and the state separate. You could have religion separate. Isn't that right? Because whenever the church and the state came together, what happened? Persecution. So when they came into the new world, they set up this secular culture, which was supposed to be neutral, so that the church and the state, and they could all exist together. But today what has happened is secularism, this world in which we exist, is no longer neutral. It has been supercharged. And now it's almost like we're walking into a headwind because forces are going against the gospel of God. And so what we see, this opposing and often hostile secularism is putting extensive pressure on what Christians believe, the ways our beliefs inform how we think, and how we live out our faith. We must regain clarity on what it means to be faithfully different from today's world. The, why? For the health of our own relationship with the Lord and our ability to effectively be salt and light to others. We're living in a different world. In fact, the acceleration is shocking. Some things that are happening today, you couldn't have imagined five to ten years ago. I'll read you just a Bible verse that we should all know. You are the salt of the earth. That's why we're here. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled under foot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Well, there are four ways in which we can understand the secular world. Four ways. Four points. Are you ready for them? I hope you are. Because if you're not, they're coming. Ready or not? This is how we understand. Uh, uh, number one, feelings are the ultimate guide. Feelings are the ultimate guide. We are bombarded with this communication and social media images with Messages like these. Some of these, here, here are some examples. Follow your heart, it knows the way. What about this one? I don't have to prove anything to anyone. I only have to follow my heart and concentrate on what I want to say to the world. I run my world, says Prophet Beyonce. Have you heard of that prophet? What about this one? Follow your heart because if you always trust your mind, don't trust your mind. You will always act on logic and logic doesn't always lead to happiness. Whatever you do, don't trust your mind. Follow your heart. What about this one? You do, you do have to follow your heart. Otherwise, you're living a false life. Follow your heart. It's always right. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the ends thereof 
What about this one? Here's Paula Abdul. Maybe some of you remember her straight up. She used to sing that song. If you remember, I won't sing the lyrics. Break the rules, stand apart, ignore your head, and follow your, your heart. This is the first rule of how secularism, this is the guide for life today. Now, if secularism uh, means feelings are the ultimate guide, what's the next step? Well, the next step is happiness is the ultimate goal. In this view, the only measure of life success is whether a person has been in touch with their feelings enough to know and pursue what would make them happy, happiest. In other words, if I'm led by my feelings, I, all I want to do is I want to be what? Happy. But the problem with happiness is what? Happiness is influenced by external things. In other words, if it's raining outside and I wanted to go to the beach, I'm not so happy today. Isn't that right? Or if somebody says something, that ups- it can upset me and I'm not. So, so in the world, you would then think logically that they're going to need to shut things up that are saying things that they don't want to. Starts to make sense, doesn't it? But as Christians, what do we know? We know the Bible says the joy of the Lord is our strength. In other words, there is an internal peace which comes from knowing Christ that even if it is hailing outside, amen, even if things are going wrong, if I'm in Christ Jesus and Jesus is in me, the world may rock and roll and shake. I have the peace of God. Maybe that's what the world is looking for. Well, the third point is judging is the ultimate sin. If you want to come alongside another person to love and help them on their journey that it entails, first, you have to affirm their chosen path. Then you, or you have to affirm the nature of what happiness means to them. If you question the path or the nature of their chosen happiness, it's off limits. That's being judgmental, and to be judgmental is to be hateful. If anything at all is classified as sin in secular culture, it's the act of judging others. But for them, judging is, you could say, listen, hey, why don't you try things? This is not going to be the best for you. Don't be so judgmental. Go ahead and follow your heart and pursue your happiness, but don't stop along the way to claim that someone else is following their heart or pursuing their happiness wrongly. We can only affirm self-authority. Finally, the fourth step is God is the ultimate guest. You can believe in God. A secular view can accommodate a generic belief in the supernatural as long as it doesn't require anything from a person. So God isn't necessarily out the picture. You just can't be certain. There's no certainty, only comfortable guesswork that ensures no one can ever be wrong. Once again, the individual maintains incontestable authority. In other words, you, you can't be sure. You have to be, it has to be a guess. Why? Because, because otherwise you would challenge the, the authority of the internal self of others. That's the world that we live in. So in short, secular messages about God are rooted in the assumption that confidence in the truth of any specific religious view is unfounded. This uncertainty lays the necessary groundwork for the self to take its place of authority. God is anyone's guest, so we're free to be in charge. You know what we've seen today? is what they saw years ago. It was called paganism. Polytheism. It was in Rome. It's no different. In fact, remember when the, we can go as far back when the serpent came to Eve and he said, did God really say? Starting to doubt God's word and and then you will be like God's. Well, can we learn something from the Bible? I want to take you to uh, a story in the Bible, one of my favorite 
uh, stories, not because he had long hair, but in Judges chapter 14, Judges chapter 14, Judges 14, and notice we're going to pick up in verse 2, and this is Samson, and we know Samson was strong, and he was educated, and his mother grew him up in the nurture of the Lord, and, and we pick up in verse 2, so, so he went up and told his father and mother, saying, I have seen a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines, now therefore get her for me as a wife. Isn't that a good way to get a wife, huh? Went to his parents, just get her. He sees her. He wants her. Now he goes to the parents. He says, go get her for me. Then his father and mother said to him, is there no woman among the daughters of your brethren or among all my people that you must go and get a wife from the uncircumcised Philistine? And Samson said to his father, get her for me for she pleases me well. In other words, the parents came back and said, isn't there anyone in the church? He said, go get her for me. Now, he must have had lots of dreams about this woman. In fact, she was probably good looking if you go by what Samson Samson's, uh, likes and, and he sees her and maybe all of his hopes and his dreams and if he gets her, everything is going to be all right and his life is going to be fulfilled and maybe she's going to complete him. I, I don't know what's going on in Samson's mind, but he has seen what he wants. Now notice we've got to read a couple of other versions, just, just briefly, just for comparison, and I'll show you what I believe to be the most faithful to the original language. Now get her for me, for she looks good to me, So he went down and talked to the woman, and she looked good to Samson. Or or what about this one? This is the best one. I believe this is the most closest to the original. He saw one of the daughters of the Philistines, but Samson said to his father, Get her for me, for she is right in my eye. And verse 7, then he went down and talked with the woman, and she was right in Samson's eyes. Now, the interesting thing is, we know the story. When he was around the wedding, he goes away. And do you remember on his way, he he finds the lion. Do you remember that? The lion comes to attack him, and he, he kills the lion. And as he kills the lion, he comes back past the lion later, and inside the lion was the honeycomb. Yeah. And remember, he goes and he tells a riddle uh, during the wedding. uh, And, you know, they had a wedding for an elongated, a longer period. And 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 he gives them so many days to tell the riddle. And and there's no way they're going to get a riddle. And he's going to get 30 sets of garments. And as he's waiting for these garments, they go to his wife. And they start pressing her for the answer. And we know what Samson does. Eventually, he relents and he, he gives her the answer. And then she tells the Philistines, and they come back, and now he's furious. Remember, he goes out and he slaughters some men and brings back their garments, and he pays his debt. And that beautiful woman, the one who was going to answer all of the desires of his heart, the one who was going to complete him, the one that was going to fulfill everything that he wanted, what does he do with her? He gives her away to his friend. That's Samson. That, 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 that's, this is Samson. Now, what we notice is what is Samson functioning on? Is Samson functioning on counsel? No, his parents try to tell him stuff, but he, but he wouldn't listen. Is Samson functioning on wisdom? No, 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 he's not applying what he knew as a child. Is Samson functioning on divine guidance? Or is he functioning on his feelings? His emotion. Is he following his heart? You go into chapter 16 and straight away, go to chapter 16. Samson went to Gaza and there he saw a prostitute and he went into her. Just just the words are just straight and clear. Whatever Samson wanted to do, Samson would do it. If something tickled his fancy, Samson would just go ahead. 
So Samson is living according to the flesh. He's following the promptings of his feelings. He's following his heart until he sees Delilah. Now Delilah, she was going to be, the, she is the one, isn't she? This is the, she was more beautiful than the first one. And now he sees but Delilah and he's thinking, oh, you know, in fact, the language that it uses in regards to Delilah is, is in intensity. It's higher than, the, than the, the other experiences he had. So surely she's the one. But the same pattern that we saw with the other one, where he told his wife something that he shouldn't have, when we know she wanted to know, the Philistines wanted to know the secret of his power. She pressed him, and she pressed him. She pressed him sorely. Notice, and when Delilah had saw, he, he finally gives it up. And at each step, he's getting closer and closer, making smaller and smaller compromises until he tells her all his heart. His heart was leading him when his heart should have been in the hands of God. When Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up again, for he has told me all his heart. And remember, they had come before, and it was a false alarm, but now she says, Come, I know this time. Then the lords of the Philistines came up to her and brought the money in their hands, and the Philistines seized him and gouged out his eyes. And brought him down to Gaza and bound him with bronze shackles. And he ground at the mill in the prison. But the hair of his head uh, began to grow again after it had been shaved. Samson was a person who lived in perpetual submission, not to God, but to temptation. He was always ready to follow his desires, to move where his flesh led him. But I want to thank God that we don't have to be like Samson. Amen? That we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. And in a world that is going haywire, the way that we can shine for Christ is to stand on that which God has called us to stand. We can see differently. What, what do I mean? Well, notice here in Judges, and this is our last long passage, and then we're going to start to uh, draw it out, and then we're going to finish. But notice what it says here. Then Samson called to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, please remember me and please strengthen me only this once, O oh God, that I may be avenged on the Philistine for my two eyes. And Samson grasped the two middle pillars on which the house rested and he leaned his weight against them his right hand on the one and his left hand on the other. And Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. Then he bowed with all his strength and the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people who were in it. So the dead whom he had killed at his death were more than those whom he had killed during his life. Then his brothers and all his family came down and took him and brought him up and buried him between Zorah and Eshtal. In the tomb of Manoah, his father, he had judged Israel 20 years. Isn't it interesting that if you were to gauge Samson's life in deaths of Philistines, he was more successful when he was blind than he was when he could see. Can we make a spiritual application? That as Samson is seen in the flesh, as Samson is being led by the flesh, it's not until he stops seeing and he sees by faith. Today we're living in such a world where God is calling us, don't see by the flesh, he is calling us to see by faith and to look out into a world that we can see through the lens of the gospel, through the lens of the word of God. We're called to see differently. And if we're going to be successful as God's people in our own Christian experience, 
We need to see by faith. If we're going to be successful as a church, we need to see by faith. We are called to see differently. We are called to not let the world and the things of the flesh lead us around. What are we called to see by faith? Well, personally, we're called to see the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? The good news, we discussed it in Sabbath school. Praise God. That our standing and the achievements of Christ, we're to rejoice that the lamb that was slain, like the sanctuary service, how the spotless lamb, my standing is based upon his spotless perfection. And as it's presented on my behalf, praise God, I'm accepted of the Father based on the spotless lamb. Amen? That's the sanctuary, what it teaches. The gospel of Jesus. Praise God that through what Jesus has done, faith in Christ, we have been reconciled to God through the death of Christ. Amen. Glory to God. We can go freely before the Father. How? I mean, it's just amazing. And I, I was thinking, man, should I get out Romans 5? But we don't have time here today. But, but how beautiful it is as we read Scripture. The gospel of Jesus Christ. We have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Our sins have been washed away. Our guilt has gone. We are children of God through faith in Christ and the leading of the Spirit as God's Spirit now is our guide, not the flesh. We're called to experience a radical submission to Christ and we're giving ourselves, Lord, I am yours. In fact, I suggest you remember Jesus says, if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out. Amen. Pluck them both out. Amen. See by faith. Put your whole, and what radical means, radical submission, Christianity, you know, is a radical religion. Because Christianity, what it means to be radical is to go to the root. Christianity is a heart issue. Amen. And God wants to go to the root of our problems. And when we say, Lord, I belong to you, he goes right to the root. And he does something that only God could do. And then we experience his overcoming power in our lives. I had an experience, and I, I tell this story wherever I go, and I'm sure some of you, I know one of you, would have heard this story before, but that's okay, amen. And I used to work in Sydney because the gospel is so important. It's so important that we, we, we understand by faith, this is the anchor for our souls. This is where the roots go so deep. By faith, this is to be first and foremost in our life. And, and as we get up in the morning, we should rejoice in the achievements of Christ because it centers us in him, and, 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 and th I got a knock on the door, and I used to live in Wesley, in, in Sydney, Australia, and the, someone, my neighbor came from back, and he said, listen, past, uh, you, you're a pastor? I said, yes. He said, one of your members, he, he, he's smelling up the house. He was a, a property owner, and he had a, a double house. You know how you, you have a, a, one property, and you cut it in half, and he had one of those properties, and down the back, he had another house. And he said, you smell, uh, this particular gentleman that goes to your church, he's smelling out our house. Now, as a pastor, I didn't realize I was a bailiff or a, you know, what do you do, throw people out of houses? Part of the, part of the curriculum, hey? And a job description. And uh, I said, okay. And I had noticed a man, and he used to limp, he used to come into church, and he said, and, and the, the gentleman at the door said, can you get him out of the house? So I said, well, I better go and try and sort this out. So I went around to the house. And I knock on the door, and as I knock on the door, I can start, start to smell something a little bit. And I'm knocking on the door, and, 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 and some old tricks, I knock the door in a way, so the door started to creak open. Eh? And as the door starts to creak open, now the smell was coming in. And so now the smell is coming, I'm like, whew. And I, I kind of push knock, you know, so I'm not breaking in, but I'm push knocking, you know. So I, 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 the door is now wide open. And as I look, I think I hear a faint help. And as I look out, out there, I see number ones all over the floor. Now the smell is really there, and I, and I hear the help. It goes, anyone there? And I hear the help again. So I walk in, and as I walk in, I turn to the right, and there's a doorway. And in the doorway, I can see the edge of the bed, and the bed, I can see the corner of a sheet like something has rolled off on the other side. And I, and, I, and I walk in, and as I walk in, and, and I, I look down, 
and I see him on the other side of the bed. Now, he would have been about 140 kilos. He was lying naked, and I didn't realize that he had one amputated leg. So now he's lying there, but that's not the kicker. He's lying in number one and number two. Now, I wish you could, you know, I wish, you know, I've been to the gym this week, but even going to the gym, I couldn't pick him up like this, hey? You know, you go and wash my hands. I had to squat down and pull him close to me, get his back right up against me, and then stand up and roll him onto the bed. And I, I remember rolling him onto bed. I said, hey, you need something to drink because obviously he'd been dehydrated. I didn't know how long he was there. I said, I'll go get you some water. And he goes, no, I, my Coke is in the fridge. I said, I'll, here I am, a good Adventist health message. No, that'll dehydrate. I'll get you your water. He said, no, I want my Coke. I said, I'll get you. Now, I figured out as we, we almost started to argue, hey, eh, that I better just get him his Coke. Amen. So I went and got him his Coke, and I bought him his Coke. Then I went outside, because now I'm trying to breathe, because the smell is, and I'm outside under the carport, and the owner comes, he goes, is he all right? I said, and we called the ambulance. I said, man, the smell. I said, if I could just, I mean, I said, it's, it's almost like the smell has gone all in my nostrils, and I can't get it out. And he stood back, and he looked at me from my toes up, and he said, it's not in your nostrils. You know, I was driving home that day, and we didn't have air conditioner in our car. The windows were down, and I'm <gasps> trying to breathe, and the smell is coming in. And I started to get phone calls, and the phone calls were from the family. Thank you so much. You saved them. Thank you for what you did. Thank you so much. And I remember the last phone call was, and, and thank you so much, Pastor. You saved his life. If you didn't do anything, and you know, all I did was knock on the door and get, smell some stinky stuff and put them on the bed. That's all I did, call 111. And then, and then I put down the phone. I never forget, thank you so much, Pastor, what you did. And I just had this deep impression. You picked him up. But I would have loved to have cleaned him up. You know, that's God, amen? God loves to take us. A and the achievements of Christ, he has won the right, amen? That we, we don't need, when we look to Christ and we put our faith in him and we trust in him and we see, and you know, seen by faith, not with fleshly eyes. You know, with fleshly eyes, we become discouraged and we feel our guilt and we feel beat down and we don't feel worthy. But praise God, when we look to Christ, we see that he is worthy. His salvation. And you see, our very first step is to personally see by faith the achievements of Christ. But then you see, we go on because, uh, because what we see is corporately as a church, we need to see differently. Amen? We do. We were called to a little church. In fact, as a student, to go in, I think they, they realized that I was a bit of a nutty student and we liked a challenge. Amen? And they put us in this difficult little church. It was just outside Newcastle. And they said, and you know what people would say about this church? They said, the church will never grow. In fact, I still hear sometimes pastors say that. And this little church, they said, the church will never grow. And we went there, and first thing we did, we said, Lord, and, and you know, I'm nutty. I took off the glasses of flesh, because if you looked in the flesh, they are right, hey? But you take them off, and you put on the glasses of faith, and you say, God, I believe you can do something. Amen. I believe where two or more are gathered in your name, there you are in the midst. And this group, I think maybe just around 10, just in double digits, and we started to pray. And I remember there was this place across the road from the church, and they used to call it the zoo. Now, it wasn't a zoo, huh? even though it had some animals in there. We went door knocking in there, and we went to door knocking this one door, and the lady opened the door, and her eyes were bulging, and she said, oh, come in, come in. I thought, oh, we haven't even said anything, huh? Now, little did we know, she thought we were the police, huh? <laughs> Cut a long story short, we started having Bible studies with her. Amen, hey? You know, that church doubled, nearly tripled in size. We're called to see by faith, amen? And it may not be the, just the church, but in your personal life, we're called God can do amazing things. When we, when we put self aside and see by faith. You know, there was one time I went to jail and praise the Lord, it was for prison ministry. Amen. Eh? 
went to jail and I walked in there and, you know, you hear all the doors clanking. They clank and close and clank and close until we get into the... We're in the Ramand in Mount Eden. And so we're there in the Ramand in Mount Eden. And as, we, as I'm standing there, I'm standing at the front and the guys are coming in and the prison guards are at... And they're all lined up. In fact, they looked a little bit like this. No. <laughs> and uh, one guy comes in and I see him and he sees me. And you know, his name was Lucky. What a bad name, huh? And I see Lucky, Lucky see... We went to the same school. A couple more guys walk in, and they see me, I see them. We went to the same school too, hey? We were having a school reunion. And as they saw me, they sat kind of in the front, a bit to the right, and they were laughing because what happened was, when we were growing up, I disappeared off the streets. They ended up in the gangs, but I ended up in church. And so now they're looking at me, and they're laughing, and they're saying, that's where Cliff ended up. And they're laughing, and now as they're laughing, have you ever seen that picture of Homer Simpson disappearing into the hedge? Well, here was a crowd of people, and I started to disappear. eh? And I got to the back of the room, and I started to feel uncomfortable, and I felt ashamed that I was part of this Christian group. And I started to think, what was that? That self. And I started to think, "Uh uh-oh, I can't preach from the back of the group. And so I, I remember having this conversation with God. I said, Lord, I don't care what they think. I care what you think. I'm going to choose to stand for you. And I moved from my fleshly concerns to trusting by faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I came out, and as I preach, and you know sometimes in life, I don't know, you may have had this experience, but sometimes God shows up. You know, that day, the whole prison was deathly silent. It was like if you dropped a, a pin, you could have heard it. Even the guards were deeply under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. When we see by faith, God does things. Amen? And see, personally, we're called to look to the cross and look to Jesus by faith. Praise God, he is coming back soon. Amen? But also corporately, as a church, we are to look to our Lord and Savior. He is the head of the church. We are called to share the gospel of Jesus Christ faithfully to the world. This involves the acknowledgement that the human race race has a huge problem, and the problem is what? Sin. And in fact, today, uh, what's happening in our world, there is a fight for what what the problem is. Why? Because if you can identify the problem and you can make the problem this, you can you can uh, uh, create the alternative. In other words, they're making things the problem that aren't the problem. So, for instance, you'll hear lots of people saying the problem with our world is colonization. We need to decolonize everything. Well, CRT, critical race theory. Now, I'm against racism just like any of you, all of you. Amen. We all should be against racism. But, friends, I want to share, racism is a problem that all of us have. Amen. And you see, as a church, we should be here uniting, not dividing. We should be the answer to the problems in the world. But, we, but the real problem is not those things. Those things are a symptom of the problem. Those things are a symptom of sin. And the thing that cures the sin problem is what? The gospel. So that even though the world may look around and think that we're crazy, preaching the gospel, we're seen by faith. We know what's really at the heart of the issue in the world. We have a vital role to play in earth's closing scenes. We are called to move forward in the mission of Christ faithfully. Faithfully. Sensitively in the world that we live in because many things can be misconstrued, but we cannot move away from God's word. And we are called to seek revival and reformation in our midst. We might need to say, Lord, I need to repent. Lord, I'm sorry for functioning in the flesh. Lord, I'm sorry for the way I've been. Lord, I need to turn holy to you. God is faithful. Amen. God is faithful. Today, I just want to encourage you. 
Let us not be Samson-like Christians. Let us see by faith. A closing quote, God's promise that through Samson he would begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines was fulfilled. God still accomplished his promise, amen. But how dark and terrible the record of that life, which might have been a praise to God and a glory to the nation. Had Samson been true to his divine calling, the purpose of God, had he, had he just always continued day by day, Lord, I trust in you. Uh, God could have been a comp- good. God could have been accomplished in his honor and exaltation, but he yielded to temptation and proved untrue to his trust, and his mission was fulfilled in defeat and bondage and death. Physically, Samson was the strongest man upon the earth, but in self-control, integrity, and firmness, he was one of the weakest of men. Praise God that God wants weak men, amen, who see by faith. Don't trust in the things of the world. May we be people living in this world who look by faith to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Today, may we be anchored personally in Jesus, amen? And as a church, may we be a wonderful blessing, seen by faith, going out into the world to be a light in darkness. And realizing the gospel is the core of why we're here. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you that we can be together. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your challenges. Thank you that you've called us, Lord, to live lives that at the end of all things will really matter. Help us, Lord, even though the way of the flesh is enticing, to every day intentionally choose to see like you'd have us to see by faith. Trusting in you personally for our own experience and walk with you, but also trusting in you, knowing that you're leading us on a journey to help others have a saving relationship with you. Bless this place. Bless Pastor Wesley. Bless the elders. Bless every minister that is in here from the youngest child to the oldest saint. May your name be glorified as we look to you by faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Clifton. Praise the Lord for those words. You know, our next song is Nothing Between... And as I was reading this story, because it was Charles Tindley that wrote this song, his mother died when he was age two, and Charles's father hired him out. It was not an unusual thing for freed blacks to labor alongside the slaves and experience much of the reality that was required to sacrifice worldly pleasure and warning us not to be led astray this world's elusive dreams, let nothing between. Let nothing between us and our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. Let's all stand, please, as we sing this song, Nothing Between.
Father, what a joy it is to be in your house. And we thank you so much that we, by faith, can cling on to your promises for what you have achieved, Lord, and the great promise of your love for us, Lord, and the plan that you have to give us future and a hope. I pray again a blessing upon this church. I pray for each individual that we may make up our minds not to be led by our hearts or by the flesh, but to be led by our loving Savior. And teach us, even in the small things, whether it be the first thing we do in the morning, uh, whether it's our phone or the Bible, help us to turn always to you, to set that foundation, one day at a time, that we may always see by faith. Bless us individually, bless us as a church, and thank you that we can worship your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.